Welcome to But Jesus Drank Wine and other stories that kept us stuck. I'm Mead. And I'm Christy. In this podcast, we'll explore the stories that kept us, well, stuck, wanting to drink and not wanting to drink all at the same time. Join us as we show you that freedom from alcohol does not have to mean a life sentence of misery and missing out, but actually means living an authentic life full of peace, joy, and purpose. Hi, gals. How we doing? Great. Yay. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I am I'm so like good. so beyond excited for today. Um, I'm so excited. Just so excited. <laughs> I'm excited to introduce um, my former client, Ashley. Um, and we keep saying that this, everything about this recording is divine, but I really feel like you being one of my very first clients was divine because we had so much fun and it was just a blast coaching you and becoming your friend. Um, so Ashley is now in Dallas, correct? The Dallas, Fort Worth area in a, in a town called South. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she's got two kiddos, an eight year old daughter and a 10 year old son. Mm -hmm. She's an awesome yoga instructor. And um, yeah, her body is bananas. <laughs> <laughs> she's also... She's also um, a medical spa consultant. So I guess one of the reasons we had so much fun in our coaching is we talked a lot about Real Housewives, uh -huh. Yellowstone, and Botox. Yes. So <laughs> we became fast friends. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Ashley, tell us, tell the people, tell the tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your story and how, why you wanted to start coaching and all the good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, I wanted to say just how divine this this whole situation of me being here, um, you know, when I was in the space of total desperation, you know, I literally cried out like in tears, God, send me someone, please send me someone to help me through this process. And he sent me you. And that's just, it's just so amazing. Like you are the person that God sent to me. Isn't that, isn't that so cool? You're going to make me cry. I mean that you, you yeah. are the answered prayer. Like you are the person that God chose to come into my life. And I just think that's so beautiful. And now, you know, a year and a half later, here we sit. How divine. So beautiful. Uh, I love that. You're literally making me cry. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. So tell us how, how your kind of journey started. How did you get to that point of like being like, I need help. Oh my goodness. Well, um, you know, it kind of just starts back in, you know, my early years of drinking and, um, you know, I started off drinking. At, well, I remember my first drink actually, which is funny because, um, I grew up in Kentucky, so it was bourbon and, uh, Philip Morris ruled the state. <laughs> and, uh, so my parents had a party and a uh, new year's Eve party, and it was probably circa 87, 88. And when they came to ring in the new years, I picked up a, a cup and had a sip and it was bourbon with cigarette ashes in it. So <laughs> that should have been my oh. first red flag right there. Right. I'll never forget my first drink. Made space. <laughs> Cigarette ashes. Like, I mean, the first taste of alcohol is bad enough. But like, <laughs> Cigarette ashes in it. Oh, my gosh. Get that. Yeah, for sure. That should have been um, a warning. But and it wasn't. And I, and I continued on. Um, but, I, you know, I started drinking in high school um, with girlfriends. We uh, had one girlfriend who was home we'd always go to. I went to an all-girls private school. So <laughs> we liked to, to drink on the weekends and, and uh, hang out at her house, go down to the basement and just drink and laugh and have a good time. But, you know, I don't ever remember getting drunk, just kind of drinking because that's the thing that we were all doing. And it was just, you know, whatever. I didn't didn't really take it too seriously in high school. Um, but you know, towards my senior year in high school, we would go to the Kentucky Derby and go to the infield. And there were some, some times where I noticed that my drinking was, was a little different than others. You know, I'd go to that, that point of not remembering and kind of, um, having fuzzy days turn into fuzzy nights. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that started in high school. And then 
I took the summer off between uh, my senior year in college or a year off. And um, I had a fake ID and I was 18. And I went into um, a club, you know, big dance club in, in, my home, in my hometown, thinking I was real cool. And I went with some friends and a boyfriend, found myself bellied up to the bar and um, ran in to my um, boss at the time and my manager. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So I'm thinking I'm so sophisticated. I'm here on a fake ID. Uh, my manager, he was in his late 20s. My boss, he was in his mid to late 30s. Drinking with them. All of a sudden, they start ordering me shots. I start drinking more and more. The last thing I remember was them putting me into their car. And the next thing I remember is waking up in my boss's bed. At 18. Yeah. So um, that was that was huge for me. That was. Um, it was interesting that alcohol brought me there and it was interesting that I used alcohol for years later to kind of cope with with what had evolved, you know, and I think it's something that we don't really talk about or teach young women uh, the dangers of alcohol and mm. the situations that we can get ourselves into um by you know consuming alcohol being around people that are um kind of in a position to um persuade you to drink more alcohol um so yeah that was a scary moment for me and alcohol for sure yeah yeah and then what did it i mean that's just yeah I, I'm so sorry that you went through that. It's just, it is, it's, we don't talk mm -mm. about it. And I thought, I think it's so interesting that not in a judgmental way, obviously, mm -hmm. but that we kept, we kept drinking after oh. that, right? Like we all have moments like that where, okay, that probably should have been a giant red flag, but instead of taking a beat to, you know, stop and figure it out, we drink sometimes even more to just like cope with something like that. 100%. And, um, you know, this was in the 90s. So there wasn't a lot of discussion around alcohol, intoxication, consent, what that looks like, you know, as much as it would be now, I think. So I take responsibility for putting myself into that situation. But I also know now how dangerous and um, how vulnerable you become with that drug of alcohol, you know, and through the grace, the grace of God, I don't remember much of that evening, um, but I know and I, I knew enough to it always sit in my heart and know that it was, it was something that uh, could be very dangerous, could be could be scary, but that didn't stop me. Yeah, <laughs> that did not stop me. Yeah, in fact, it um, that it kind of continued my. Um, it kind of continued using, I, I continued using alcohol because it caused angst and uh, panic in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that, I went on um, through college, you know, that had a, a whole process involved, you know, through the courts and everything, which, you know, was, was heartbreaking, you know, it was just devastating, but you, 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 you move past it and you, and you go forward. And, um, I, you know, I blame myself instead of really blaming, um, the adults in the situation and the alcohol, which I really should have looked at. Yeah, of course. You know? Yeah. But it's a good lesson to, 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 to pass on to my daughter and my son. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the I, alcohol um, kind of continued, you know, through college and, and all of that. And um, it was around mid-20s when I started to notice that I was having anxiety and the kind that um, presents itself as panic and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, I distinctly remember being at a restaurant bar with my family and a panic attack started to come on and I didn't know what to do with it. Like I had no idea. So I got up, this was in the afternoon, I went to the bar, ordered myself a vodka soda, sucked that down, 
I even smoked a cigarette and, and it just completely took the anxiety away. Like, whew. it was like a miracle. And from then on, as long as I had alcohol near me, I knew I was safe. I knew I was safe from that feeling of panic and angst. And, um, yeah, it became my, my binky, my buddy. <laughs> yeah. As, as someone who has had panic attacks, I mean, I know that feeling, uh, and, and it's so interesting how alcohol can make that little tiny entrance mm. into that. And I mean, because I mean, when you're having a panic attack, you feel like you are, mm -hmm. like you are, you feel like, and so it's so, ah, oh, it's just so insidious the way that alcohol gets in there and then it becomes you know, reinforced mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So can I also just say real quick that like, I am struck by your courage, Ashley, like mm. what a beautiful soul you are. Mm. And I just, your courage and sharing what you're sharing. I, I, I'm sitting here in awe of just how beautifully courageous you are. And so Oh, yep. well, thank you. You know, you don't, I don't want to, I didn't want to start it off too heavy, but I also wanted to share, you know, because other people have yeah. shared with me, like they've been in situations where, you know, it's, it's kind of gone down that path and there's so much guilt and shame around it, you know? And, um, yeah, I'd love it if we just talked more as, as, um, humans just, Hey, you know, this is the danger of alcohol and this is what happens. And, um, it's scary, but you can get past it. You can get past it and have an amazing, beautiful life. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. So good. Yeah. And um, alcohol was kind of my buddy. And um, I went through college, finished college. Um, and always, you know, I, again, my drinking looked a little bit different because I don't know, maybe, you know, it was different in the fact that I was always having to, uh, regulate or moderate. I remember going mm -hmm. into my drinking, like, okay, Ashley, like, if you want to remember this night, you got to chill and you got to count your drinks and you got to be cool because you can, you can go to blackout town real quick. So I always had to stay <laughs> regulated, you know, and I would look to other people and some people weren't, you know, that drunk and then other people were way off the edge. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not there. So I'm cool. You know, I'm, I'm all right. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, you know, getting into my thirties, um, and through relationships and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, where things just weren't working out, you know, things just weren't working out in relationships and, um, I found myself with a, uh, group of girls that, um, were actually pretty toxic. Um, and we drank a lot. That's when I started more day drinking in my thirties, going out to brunch. Um, I started educating myself on wine and thinking I was a real connoisseur, you know, that I could go to the restaurant and pick out a bottle of, of really nice wine and like, talk about it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean, Christy? <laughs> <laughs> been there oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah we'd plan wine tastings and you know oh gosh um so I was hanging out with these group of women and just you know it was all it was all divine it was so blessed that um I just I just came to a point where I just knew the friendships weren't good for me anymore and um I just decided to end those friendships and I got to a really lonely place. And I remember coming home from work and this was in my thirties. And then I started stopping at the convenience store and picking up wine or picking up a six pack. And then I started drinking alone at home. <clears throat> so that was a first, you know, I never drank alone. I'd only drank on the weekends or brunch or, you know, maybe we're going out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever, but it was never alone. Um, so I started drinking and then I started making some really bad choices, you know, staying out all weekend, crashing at people's homes. Um, yeah, really bad choices. And um, I had a spiritual situation that just blew my mind. And um, it's wild, y'all. It's wild. So this was in my 30s. And um, 
I was in bed. This was after a long weekend of drinking, like drinking on Thursday, Friday, all day, Saturday, all day, Sunday at the lake. I'm living in Austin, party, party, party. And, uh, I finally get to sleep on Sunday. I wake up and I can't move. So it's like a sleep paralysis which later I found out was called sleep paralysis with some sort of hallucinations, y'all. It was wild. So I'm laying in bed. I can't move. And I, I, I can see in the corner of my room like this dark energy. It's dark. And it sounds so wild. <laughs> but it, it's, it's almost like a dream state, but you're awake. And I just feel this, this dark spirit like coming towards me in my room and I can't move. I can't do anything. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, my Bible is in my nightstand. Like if I could just get to it, maybe I could like make these, the spirit go away or something. Uh, but then, you know, I came out of it and I thought that was horrifying. Like what is happening? Mentally, something's not right. You're going spiritually. I'm a wreck. Uh, I'm staying out all night. I'm coming into work hungover. Um, so I reached out to one of my friends and I was like, hey, like, I think I need some help. And he said, I'm going to put you in contact uh, with some of my girlfriends and, and they're going to help you out. So I got a phone call later on uh, at work and um, it was a girl named Holly. And she just said, hey, let's meet for coffee when you get off work. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> and so I met her at a place uh, down on South, Con South Congress in Austin and we started having coffee and they're like, tell me about, you know, what's going on. And I'm like, well, my drinking is like next level. And they're like, okay. Then I see everyone kind of get up from the table and start walking. They're like, okay, well, it's time to go. We're going to take you to a meeting. I was like, uh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. So I walked into my first AA meeting and um, started uh, going to AA, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, I, um, how, what did that look like? If you don't mind sharing, because I think that's something that, um, you know, I, it was not appealing to me. It didn't, it wasn't going to be a fit, but in all fairness, I never tried it. And so, um, it, you know, that being my only option kind of kept me further stuck, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. to, obviously the theme of this podcast, I feel like is courage, like mm -hmm. your courage and all the things and like your courage to call your friend and say, like, this isn't right. I need help. And your courage to try what, you know, meet these women and then go try. Like, I just, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so can, you, can you share a little bit about what that? Absolutely. Was like? It was terrifying again. So I'm, I feel like at this point, I'm so fragile. I'm so exposed. I'm so defeated. And um, I'm sure you all have had this experience after coming off like a long bender of alcohol. You're just emotionally raw. And so I walk mm -hmm. into this meeting just kind of, uh, uh, what am I doing here? How did I end up here? Um, but they were, it was just um, I, also a very cool atmosphere in Austin. It was, um, they have a really fantastic sober community there. Lots of artists, lots of musicians. So it was, it was actually kind of cool. It was like this club that I was now invited into. I'm like, okay, yeah, I want to be one of y'all. So um, sat down and then they kind of looked at me to like stand up and say, my name is Ashley and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like, oh, wait, no, um, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that, but I did it. Uh, and they gave me uh, the big book is what it's called to take home. And then one of the girls that I met for coffee, she became my sponsor. And so she walked me through the steps uh, almost, you know, right away. Mm -hmm. So how long did it, how long, how did you end up to getting to, you know, reaching out to Christy mm -hmm. for coaching? Like what was this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was going, this was in 2008 that this happened or that I went through this whole experience. And, um, you know, I think it served its purpose at that time in my life. I needed some direction, some guidance, and I think that it was an absolute blessing. Um, mm -hmm. And I did, I walked through the steps and, and did all, all that. But, you know, part of being in the AA community is really over and over and over repeating this mantra that I'm an alcoholic, 
there's something wrong with me. I was born this way. It's a disease. I'm never going to be cured. And if I'm not constantly working this program, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And you're indoctrinated into that belief. So it's scary. There's a part of, there was, for me, my experience, that I've got to cling on to this so tight because my other option is death, you know, or uh, mm -hmm. something horrible. And I wanted, you know, this wonderful life. And um, so, you know, that there's these promises in AA where if you follow this set of steps and rules and keep repeating them, wonderful and great blessings are going to happen for you. So I started seeing these things happen. Um, as I look back now, of course, if we take alcohol out of our life and, and start acting right, yeah. you know, then wonderful things will happen. So, uh, you know, I started doing really well at my job. I was able to buy my first home. They tell you not to date anyone for a year. So I was really concentrating on myself, meditation, prayer, all of these wonderful things felt really great. Um, and I stayed uh, in that uh, program for about a year and a half. And then I met Paul, my husband. Yeah. And I prayed for him and um, just what a blessing. So met Paul and <clears throat> he met me sober. And uh, so, which is so funny because uh, of what's to come in the future. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Oh, I love him. So, um, yeah, continued on drinking or excuse me, continued on not drinking, but you know, there's, there's some shame that I felt around AA. And so I didn't go to meetings or anything like that when we were dating with him. I didn't want him to know that I was, he just knew that I didn't drink. Yeah. Someone yeah. had told him or someone had said something about me going to meetings or something like that. He's like, oh, you go to meetings? I was like, yeah. I mean, I used to. Um, he's like, oh, that's cool. You know, whatever. And so I just kind of got away more away from that program and just kind of fell in love, you know, and went through experience of dating and um, put a lot of my energy into the first sober relationship that I'd ever had as an adult. Yeah. And that was really cool. <clears throat> Um, he proposed to me a year later and we went to Paris to celebrate, <clears throat> pardon me. And we were in Paris. This was 2009, no, 2000, excuse me. We met in 2010. So this is 2011, something like that. And then we were in Paris and I thought, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. Mm. I'm normal now. I'm safe. Yeah. I did it. I'm going to have a glass of mm. wine. So I did. And I started drinking again. <laughs> and he got to see the gator come out that weekend for sure. <laughs> I had it. I mean, I have to go back a little bit in my drinking because it wasn't all, I mean, whatever, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. I mean, I was the girl that you would invite to the party and I would turn up. Like I, you, if you wanted a good time, invite me. I was your girl. I'd have cocktails with you. I'd have happy hour. I'd have a party and, and make sure that everyone was having a good time. Show pony, right? Show pony. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lights, camera, action. Here I come. And, uh, it was, it was, but getting me to stop drinking was like wrestling an alligator. So, so one of my friends gave, gave me that name, the gator, because getting me to leave a party, shut it down. Gator. I want one final lap and <laughs> maybe even open up a bottle of wine when we get home. <laughs> So he got to see the gator come this out. This is why we work so well yes. together. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. Victory lap. <laughs> Victory lap. Yep. Just one more. Just, Just one. One, more. one more. Just one more. Just one more. You can't Just leave one yet. more. Leave yet. <laughs> No, no, just, just one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hour, drink, whatever, all the things. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. I can relate. And I was the one that liked to pour the drinks too, make sure they got a real heavy buzz too. So I was the one that was pouring the drinks and, and monitoring everybody's uh, speed of uh, consumption as well. So we got to see the gator come out that weekend. And I think that kind of shocked him. He's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he opened a bottle of champagne on New Year's and we had a couple of glasses and I didn't want to let the bottle go. And he said, Ashley, we need to get, 
we need to go back home and take public transportation. We can't take that. Oh, I said, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Come on, let's drink it. You know, I can't let a bottle of champagne go to waste. Gosh, poor guy. Oh. Um, so get home from Paris. Start going um, to, you know, dinner parties and drinking wine. And it was a couple of weeks after Paris and my hangover was so bad. It was so bad. And it was lasting a couple of days and I was at work and I took a pregnancy test and I was pregnant. I was pregnant. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lord, because I probably just would have rolled on. I mean, I probably just would have kept on, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I was pregnant with Bear and didn't drink. Isn't that interesting how it just shuts off? And I found that really interesting too. And I'm thinking, if I have a disease, wouldn't this disease present itself even mm -hmm. during my pregnancy? Why am mm, I able one. to just I'm craving it? You know, I, I don't even want it. No, oh, good. There were times when I felt anxious though, you know, especially towards the end of my pregnancy that I, that the anxiety would come up and, and all that, um, and I found myself like, oh, I, I need wine. I need wine. But, you know, I I, I didn't drink it. Um, and then as soon as Bear was born, I was I was off to the races again. I was drinking. Um, and then I remember that I would have to pump and dump. Did you guys ever have to do that? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Pump and dump. Oh, yeah. At a brave game <laughs> in the stall. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, at a hot on a hot summer day. Oh my gosh, miserable. But you yeah. know what? It was the things we do. Yeah, but I was meeting moms at the park or um, at their house. Mm -hmm. They're like, "Okay, bring a bottle of the wine." You know, it's that again that whole mommy wine culture. We need this wine. It's our thing. Have the decorated yetis and and pour in the cocktails, and it's okay. And I felt like, okay, I'm okay. I'm still okay. I'm still good. Like I'm still normal. I'm normal. I'm doing what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then I got pregnant with Emerson and, um, again, just kind of stayed away from alcohol, <clears throat> but then it started, it started becoming an every night thing again. You know, every night I'm drinking, I can't wait to finish nursing. I'm actually thinking at this time, I'll be glad when I'm finished nursing because then I could get back to my regular drinking routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt that too. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's I know. sad, you know, but that awareness, like that's where I, like it's that awareness of that though that also leads to our freedom Ugh. because that, without that, uh, like without that realization, I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I just so I was thinking that, but then I was like, hey, well, you know, this is what adults do, right? Yeah, what we do. And now mm -hmm. I'm married and we're having these, these, uh, we're entertaining more and, uh, you know, that's just what you do. You bring wine over, you go over to girlfriends' homes. Uh, we had moved, uh, and to a new area. And that's how I was connecting with other women is by uh, opening up a nice bottle of wine, sitting around, mm -hmm. connecting. Um, yeah. And I was watching other women my age get totally ripped. And I'm like, oh, okay, you're okay, cool. Like, you're doing the same thing. <laughs> good. It's all good. Um, and then... <laughs> I thought, no, there was, there was a few times where I had done some things where, um, it's, it scared Paul, you know, like carrying the babies when I, after I drank too much, it just kind of being off balance and he had brought it up to me. And the fact that he brought it up to me started to bother me, um, having nights that I don't remember waking up the next day with that anxiety, that wicked anxiety mm -hmm. that just will beat you down and keep you in bed. And so I thought, okay, well, Maybe I'll try AA again. Maybe I'll give it another another go. And this time I had a different girl and I was dreading it, y'all. I was like, oh my gosh, do I really have to go through these steps again? Do I really have to call all these people and make amends? Do I have to do all these things that I'm just going through the motions? Is this the only way? 
And so I, I did it and I joined this women's group and I, I just, oh gosh, it was such torture. <laughs> it was such torture. I remember at one time I was um, sick and I was taking this medication and the girl that was sponsoring me and her sponsor had like pulled me aside and said something to the effect of, we've noticed that uh, you're acting like drugged up or something. And we, we think that you're back on alcohol or something. I'm like, ew, no, why are you coming at me like this? Like, ew, this is not, mm. forget it, forget it. I'm out. I'm out. So a couple more years, y'all. And I just kept it up, you know, just kept it up. But there was always this place in my heart. God kept telling me, Ashley, you got to come back home. You got to mm -hmm. come home. This is making you miserable. And even if I wasn't getting drunk every night, and even if I, because my, my um, drinking looked like if I could stay at home with Paul, we'd open up a bottle of wine. I'd have one or two glasses. Cool. Like that was it. But if I went out, I was turning up. That's how I was. So Paul kind of thought, okay, yeah, you, you seem okay. And I was asking him, do you think I have a problem? Do you think I had ever a problem? And I was asking my friends, they're like, no, you're great. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. But I knew, mm -hmm. I knew. I knew that, that uh, I had to come back home. I, I knew I had to find my path back home. And it just sat in my heart. And um, the last time I drank alcohol, I was at a girlfriend's house and we had dropped our kids off for a gymnastics event. Like, you know, you drop your kids off for gymnastics. Uh, the parents go out for a date night. You come back and pick up your kids. It's like an evening thing. So we met this other couple. We went out and had drinks. We played pool. Then they invite us all back to their house. So um, Paul was always good too. My husband can always moderate his drinking. So I always knew he'd be the driver. Like we're good. We all go over to we, the after party. We all go over to this couple's house and we're, we're sitting around and having drinks and having a good old time. She has a new car and it's a stick. And I'm like, what? You have a stick? I haven't driven a stick in so long. Like a stick shift, you know? And she's like, yes, girl, we should drive it. I'm like, we should definitely drive it. So I get in her car with another mother and start zipping around the neighborhood, go out onto a main street, turn around, come back, and are flying through the neighborhood, pull into her driveway, get out of the car, and I think, like, I'm Mario Andretti. Like, I thought that that was amazing. And the next morning, I wanted to die. I wanted mm. to die. I was, ugh, disgusted. Absolutely horrified. Ugh, that's so sickening. I could have taken a mo another mother from, from her children. You know, I could have left my kids without a mom. Her husband was mad at me. My husband was mad at me. Ugh, it was awful. It was awful. <laughs> it was terrible. And I thought, all right, Ashley, now's the time. It's time. Like how many more signs do you need? How many, what, what else do you need? Yeah. What else do we need to show you besides living under the br a bridge with a hot bottle of vodka? Like what, what is it going to take? I'd heard somebody say, you don't have to ride the elevator all the way down to the bottom floor. You can get out at any level. You can get out on any floor. And I felt like mm -hmm. that, that elevator was like, it was time to, to get out, but I didn't know how. Y'all, I did mm -hmm. not want to go back to AA. I'm like, that. I don't feel like I'm an alcoholic. I just feel like I'm super dependent on alcohol <laughs> and I don't know what to do. Yeah. So uh, I didn't say anything to Paul. And the next morning I just woke up and I went to an AA meeting and I'm like, no, this ain't it. This ain't it. And they wanted me to stand up and talk. And I'm like, no, gosh, don't. <laughs> so I started Googling how to stop drinking alcohol without AA. And it, yeah. And the first thing that came up was Quitlet. And so I, I'd never mm. heard of this before. So I'm like, Quitlet. And here's the top three books. So the top three books were The Snake in Mind, We Are the Luckiest, Whitaker's mm. book, um, uh, Quit Like a Woman, I think. 
Oh, and Dr. Carr, uh, Alan Carr, not Dr. Carr, Alan Carr's book. So I started with um, uh, how, uh, um, We Are the Luckiest. Tell me her name again, y'all. Um, okay. Laura yes, McAllen. Yes, yes. I started listening to that book. I started walking every day. I started listening to that book and it had me just sobbing. I don't know if you guys have read that. But I was just boohooing. I was like, yes, girl. Yeah. Yes. And I just remember there, that stopping. And this is where we come from, full circle. I stopped walking and I just, in tears, I just said, God, please, I need somebody. I need a way. Send me the way. Send me someone. And this is what I want this someone to look like. I want this to be a young woman who gets me, who understands me, who has walked a similar path. I laid it all out there to God. And I'm like, this is what I need, please. Mm -hmm. I'm in tears. Like, help me. I'm not kidding y'all. It was two days later that, that Christy showed up in my, in, on my Instagram page. I'm like, hey, girl. <laughs> hey, girl. Hey, uh, you taking new clients? <laughs> I need help. I love it. And so that's how, I, that's I how like it all that. happened. And it was, yeah, it was amazing since then. And I, I'm just so thankful. It's just, wow. Incredible. Incredible. What I just, I remember, sorry, go ahead, Mead. No, I was just going to say what a, what a beautiful story and how, uh, you know, what I love, and this is something that I, you know, we tell, we tell clients, we tell them in groups too. It's like, uh, as long as you don't give up, mm -hmm. like you will find the way, the thing that helps you the most find freedom from alcohol. And it's, it's, not maybe going to be the same thing for everybody, but as long as you don't give up. And, and that's something that I love about your story. It was like, okay, also I recognize this isn't working mm -hmm. for me over here. The AA model did not work for you, but you didn't give up. And then also in the not giving up, you know, turning it over to God and letting him, oh, you know. it's It's been such a spiritual um, walk. It's been such an amazing, an amazing answer to a prayer, you know, and see it come to fruition. You put something out there and it comes right back to you the way that you asked for. And it's just, it's beautiful. I remember asking Emerson, my daughter and Bear, after I stopped drinking, they were sitting at the kitchen table. I go, did you notice that mommy stopped drinking wine? And Emerson goes, I did mommy, but I didn't want to bring it up because I, I thought that it would remind you to drink again. Oh, oh. Yeah. and I said, really? Well, what about drinking wine? Didn't you like, and mind you, like, I usually didn't drink around my kids sometimes late at night, like that last situation. That's what bothered me. They saw me drinking. They saw me get into a car. Um, cause usually when they went to bed, I was like, oh, finally my time or when I'm putting them to bed. And, mm -hmm. um, so I was like surprised. And I said, well, what about, she goes, well, when you drink, when you would have your wine, you would just go away. You would just mm -hmm. go away. But I was physically still there, spiritually, emotionally. Yeah. I dipped out. You know, I wasn't there. She felt yeah. it on a, on a spiritual, uh, emotional level that I was no longer present. And I just thought that was, wow, wow. Okay, another, another reminder why this, this is uh, not something that I want to be doing anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how old was she when she said that? So that was a year and a half ago. So she would have been like um, six and a half. I mean, isn't that wild? Like you, we don't give these kiddos like the credit for what they're actually picking up on. At oh all, my gosh. I, think. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Didn't Bear write you like something really beautiful? I remember you taking a picture of it. Oh yeah. And now I can't remember what it was, but I, I remember he wrote you the most beautiful note. He did. And, you know, I have it in my purse and, and, and it's on, and, and it's just something about the, um, and he drew a little wine glass with an X through it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Yeah. We don't give them credit. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, I just, you know, especially since not drinking how much, um, more present I am as a mother, as a, as a wife, as a mother, as a friend, uh, he, I, the whole time. I was drinking as a mom. I felt like it was helping me be a better mom, taking the edge off. I wasn't as stressed. I was more chill. Mm -hmm. 
but really it was just, it was keeping me stuck in this swirling, just mm-hmm. dull, just pa- parenting uh, existence, really. And the call was so strong, though, y'all. The call was so strong. I'd be in the shower just hearing, Ashley, if you want all these blessings that I have prepared for you, you've, you've got to stop drinking alcohol because that's the block. That's the block between me and you, me, you know, God and, and you and us connecting. There's that block and you need to remove mm-hmm. it to be fully present and aware and authentic and vulnerable and all these things that I was so afraid to, to be. <laughs> yeah. Oh. The authentic piece is one of the pieces that I will never forget that we talked through Mm -hmm. and I'll never forget when you, when you said the word show pony to me and you, I won't, and I I use it with clients to this day. I say one of my favorite clients always and how you described it was so beautiful, but, but the, but the way of like, you know, towards the end of the drinking still turning up as that show pony, but realizing you don't even want to be Mm -mm. her anymore. And that's not even who you are anymore. Mm -hmm. And you've just become almost this like caricature of yourself as this person that is always the hostess, is always pouring the drinks, is always the last one to leave. And you don't even want to be her anymore. And that feeling of discomfort, Mm -hmm. like I just remember it like so strong. Mm -hmm. And when you voiced it to me, I was like, oh, the show pony, it's just such a perfect way to say Mm -hmm. it. Like it's, I don't, and uh, that way of, you know, leaving that unauthentic version of yourself behind and stepping into who you really are and who God really has called you to be and all this stuff. And I'll never forget mm-hmm. it. And it was just the most beautiful you know, way of saying mm-hmm. it. So mm-hmm. it's exhausting. It's, it's yeah. That, um, but it's that full circle returning mm-hmm. home and your identity we, yeah. I, mean, I was the same way. My identity was in who I was showing, whoever I needed to be in whatever situation demanded I be that way, whatever, whoever I was around and show pony, I absolutely have. I mean, party me knew how to, mm-hmm. you know, perform. I used to say like, that's what I would say. I would, I'd perform. It was, a, I was on, on the stage performing. Right. And, um, and I think that that's also, so, you know, uh, we start believing the lies that our identity mm. is wrapped up in who we are to other people and the roles that we play, the parts we pay, we play, but that, and that's where alcohol makes a really easy because we've got that in that conflict. We know that's not who we are, but we're starting to take this on and it's all happening so unconsciously, but then that, that come full circle mm-hmm. and turning you on to your identity, mm. the truth in your identity being, a, t- a daughter of the almighty and not, you know, having to be for other people, mm-hmm. like his eyes, not their eyes. I just, uh, I have like, I've been in chills this whole, it's so this whole conversation. Beautiful. It's so yeah. magical. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's so cool. You know, when I, and, and when I was thinking about this morning, how I was going to talk with y'all and I just kept saying, God, thank you. Thank Here I am mm-hmm. a year and a couple of months later, I've done it. Like, we're here. I'm here. Like, this is wild. So exciting. <laughs> so, tell, yeah, I was okay. going to say, t- tell our listeners, like, what is, what is here? What is life like yeah. free from alcohol? Because you also have the experience of being, quote unquote, maybe alcohol free for a period or sober or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. But I would imagine that the difference between what that felt like and correct me if I'm wrong, is different than how you feel now. So can you share a little bit about what life here looks like? Life here is is freedom. Freedom and space to really work at some at 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 some at some things, you know, that that have, have been going on for a while inside me. That it's time to to get out and heal and mend and to look at it and to be able to um, authentically regulate, um, mentally, spiritually with clarity. And I think, you know, drinking kept me stuck so long because anytime that these things came up, like, okay, Ashley, we, you know, you need, we probably need to look at this is me talking to myself. And, and it was just too intense. And I just drink it. You know, I just be like, ah, 
I just have a glass of wine, it went away. So I never really handled some of the things um, that I'm here for to, to, to take care of. And so it's, it's allowed me this opportunity to really work on myself. And it sounds so cliche, but really there is work to be done and it can be awesome. Yeah. And what it looks like now compared to what it looked like then when I wasn't drinking and I was in AA is completely different. Then I thought something was wrong with me. I thought I wasn't normal. I thought, oh my gosh, like I knew it. Something is wrong with me. Like this whole time I was right. Something's wrong with me. And mm -hmm. you're messed up and you were born that way. And there ain't no getting out of it, girl. So you just got to suffer through it. And every day drinking with that program for me, this is my experience, was willpower. Mm -hmm. So when they would say, take one day at a time, I really was taking one day at a time because I still wanted to drink. <laughs> the desire yeah, was yeah. there. I was just scared. Yeah. Like, oh gosh, if I drink again, then I'm going to, well, what's going to happen? I, I'm going to drive off a cliff or something. So now what I've come to realize is I'm perfect. You know, I was created perfect and not in a physical sense or, or, you know what I'm saying, but spiritually it's, I'm perfect. And that there's nothing wrong with us. It's the alcohol. It's not me. It's you. <laughs> it's the booze. And, you know, it's and once I was able to let that go and really understand that. Yeah, it's not me. It's 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 all these stories that I told myself about alcohol that was keeping me stuck and that kept me kept me drinking. Once I learned that it was like. Hallelujah, I am free. Like, I do not have the desire to drink. It is gone. I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh, gosh, I hope I can make it through the day. Like, it's not even a thought in my mind. What's freedom? It's absolute freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, you said it so beautifully. <laughs> you said it so, so beautifully. It's so great to have somebody else on here as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like when you're in that place where you are so stuck if I would have heard, if I've been listening, if I would have been listening to this podcast when I was at the place where I was stuck and I heard someone say, I, I don't even think about it anymore. It's not a desire. I would think to myself, there is no mm -hmm. way I could ever get there. Same. And so, and so, yeah, thank you for, it's just, it's so good. It's so true. That's what I like to say a lot on this podcast a lot. So good. So, true. so good. So true. <laughs> How am I possibly going to survive parenting? motherhood, moving to a new city, which I did during all of this, without alcohol, without my binky, without my tool that I've used. How am I going to do this? That, I mean, those were the thoughts that were in my head, but I mean, thriving, you know, mentally and emotionally thriving and um, just being able to connect. When you're drinking alcohol, and, you know, it doesn't leave your body, even if you just take one day off, which I rarely did. Uh, but even if you do, you're still in that haze. You're, you're mm, yeah. That, um, instead of listening to spirit and intuition, you're just blocked out by this, this um, toxin in your system that's just preventing you from connecting. And uh, it's wonderful once you get past that and you just, you you become that person you imagine yourself being like you look at these people that don't drink and that have tea at brunch and seem so happy I'm that person now <laughs> I'm that person. yeah I'm that person that will wake up and meditate and I'm the person that will take mm. off all of my makeup at the end of the night enjoy my skincare routine all the smells and just peace out and have a, a beautiful sleep and wake up and the birds are chirping. I mean, it's like a fairy tale. <laughs> oh my God. I'm just picturing the little birds from Cinderella. Yeah. You know, yes. Just, yeah. Like, yeah. I love it. I mean, why not? Oh I love God. it. Oh, I love Ashley, that. thank you so, so much for coming on here. I, I didn't prep you for this, but we like to leave listeners with like a tiny new action. We call her the tiny Tina, tiny teeny Turner. I can't even say it anymore. Is there one thing, I guess, 
Is there one thing that you'd like to say or one thing that you wish you had known back then or that you could tell yourself maybe something like just a final kind of word of encouragement? Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes up, not going to be as difficult as you think. It's actually going to be pretty easy and it's your, it's your calling. It's your destiny. It's, it's, it's happening. So, I, you know, it just fall into it and enjoy the process because it's beautiful. I and mean, it's not going to be that hard. <laughs> it's not going to be hard, hard. I love that. I love that. I love that too. It's That's so, so true. Good. I mean, it's so, it's, it's, it, for me, it has not been hard a single day in over three years since I haven't had a sip of alcohol. I haven't had a single desire to drink in over three years and not a single one of those days in over three years has been hard because I changed all of those stories. It changed all of those. I called out all those lies that said that alcohol did all these things. I called them out. I found the truth and found the freedom, just like you're mm -hmm. saying. And it's, and mm -hmm. that's where it's, I mean, the hard stuff is when you're like wrestling mm -hmm. with all the noise of like, what am I going to do? But, you know, once you find freedom, it's, it's not, mm -hmm. and it's not hard to stay free because mm -hmm. yeah. life is so good. And just to uh, stay connected to spirit, stay connected to God, be in prayer, listen to what your intuition mm -hmm. and what God is saying to you. You feel it, move forward in that direction. Because it never leads you the wrong I way. I love that. It's all divine. You just walk, keep walking towards the light, girl. Keep going because there's so many blessings ahead. Like I can't wait till next year and I can see all, all these awesome gifts that are becoming my way because I did what was asked of me, you know? So bring it on. And, oh, and I, like I have that. to say this too. Like I know we're, we're wrapping, yeah, we're trying yeah. to wrap because we're at time, but and this is what I like to do. Um, I listen. To <laughs> I mean, I know the gator, the gator. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I can and I can so relate to that. Some, some, you know, some parts. Don't we don't want the party but, um, but like, sister, <laughs> what I like, I've just met you, right? Like, we've just spent this almost hour together, and the gift of you right here as authentic, beautiful, courageous, like just full of life. Like I didn't know you before, but the gifts that you are right here to other people, I mm -hmm. can, like that return home is mm -hmm. a gift to you, but it's, I, I can guarantee it is a gift to other people for sure in your life because it's just been a gift to me in the last hour. Thank and you. I just, I'm, ugh, I'm just struck by how, uh, yeah, it's just a, beautiful story and do you thank feel you like you so much home, you've come home you know do you understand oh, feel that feeling yeah. I oh I wish I had time to pull up my journals how many times I've written exactly that like exactly that it's the greatest homecoming mm, that's beautiful greatest homecoming wonderful yeah. so so thank, thank you, you for the gift to our listeners the gift to, to us thank you and um well done, you. Oh, thanks, y'all. Y'all yeah. made it easy. It made it fun. I don't want to hang up. I just want to keep talking, talking, and <laughs> just pour some tea. <laughs> well, you. Pour some tea and keep chatting. You know, you're my people. Okay, we'll you're just, my people. We'll we'll cut yeah. it. We'll cut the recording. We'll yeah, exactly. The, the bonus episode. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thanks. Um, thanks, ladies. We'll see you next mm -hmm. Monday. Thank you, Ashley. You're the best. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. You can find all of our episodes at butjesusdrankwine.com and make sure you follow us over on the gram at Love Life Sober with Christy and Mead at I'm Not Sober, I'm Free. To learn more about what we do, you can visit our websites at meadhollandshirley.com and lovelifesober.com. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't have to worry about missing a single episode. And if you love what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. This helps more women who are feeling stuck and alone in the overdrinking cycle to find hope and encouragement. Thanks, ladies. We so appreciate you. We'll see you next week.